Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Cheryl Fife Marisich, and I'm the Executive Director of Molecular and Cell Biology at Ultragenics Pharmaceutical. Today, I'm gonna to tell you about some of the work we've done to develop a gene therapy for CDKL5 deficiency disorder. CDKL5 deficiency disorder, or CDD, is caused by a genetic defect in cyclin-dependent kinase like 5, or CDKL5. This is an X-linked neurodevelopmental disorder caused by deletions, truncations, or missense mutations in the CDKL5 gene that all lead to loss of function of the CDKL5 protein. CDKL5 loss of function leads to defective microtubule dynamics, which in turn leads to impaired communication between neurons. As many of you know all too well, patients with CDD experience pretty severe symptoms. They experience early onset seizures that often begin in the first few weeks of life. They have severe global developmental delay, intellectual disability, sleep disorder, GI dysfunction, visual problems, and breathing abnormalities. This is a disease of very high unmet medical need. There are currently no disease modifying treatments available for patients. And the seizures are generally not well controlled with current anti-epileptic drugs. And patients really do require 24 hour a day, seven day a week care due to the severity of their symptoms. As a result of recent improvements in genetic testing, we now estimate that there may be as many as 30,000 patients in North America, Europe, and Latin America. And we also estimate that there are about two new patients diagnosed every week. I wanna take just a moment to go through some of the background biology for this disease. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about microtubule dynamics today and the role of CDKL5, but I do wanna mention that CDKL5 plays many additional roles in the cell, some of which we're only just starting to learn about now. We think we have a pretty good handle of CDK, on CDKL5's role in microtubule dynamics, and so that's what I'll focus on today. We know that CDKL5 regulates key molecules that enable axonal oak growth, dendritic branching, as well as dendritic spine growth and maturation. All of these things are critical to enable proper formation of and function of synapses. So the synapse shown here in this image is where two neurons communicate with each other. So when this blue neuron is communicating with the orange neuron, it sends an action potential along its axon in the form of electrical energy. When it gets to the synapse, it's converted into chemical energy. We can see that there's neurotransmitter released into the synaptic cleft. The receiving end of the synapse is this dendritic spine from this orange neuron. There are many receptors present along the dendritic spine that can receive this chemical signal, and that enables the action potential to then be propagated and moved along that neuron. CDKL5 plays a critical role at the dendritic spine in enabling the invasion of microtubules shown here in green to enable the dendritic spine to take on this mushroom-like shape where there's an expansion in surface area uh, at the surface. Here, we can then have space for insertion of many different receptors that are critical for receiving that chemical signal. CDKL5 phosphorylates a number of key microtubule binding proteins that are impo important in this process. In the absence of CDKL5 shown on the right, the microtubules fail to invade this dendritic spine properly. That results in a stunted growth phenotype, the inability to insert sufficient receptors along the surface here and an ultimately results in an impairment in this cell being able to receive the signal from the other neuron. Our therapeutic approach here is to use a gene therapy approach. And the goal of gene therapy is to introduce a new normally functioning gene to the cell. The cell can then read that gene and produce a functional protein. We're using a viral vector called AAV9 to deliver this new CDKL5 gene to the cell. Because neurons are post-mitotic cells, which means that they don't divide, we hope that a one-time injection of our AAV9 vector will be all that is necessary. 
I should also mention that we're using a synapsin promoter to drive the expression of our human CDKL5 transgene. And here in the image, you can see shown in green, this is our AAV9 capsid. And inside, shown in blue, is our CDKL5, a copy of our CDKL5 gene. We inject this into the cerebral spinal fluid that enables the vector to circulate throughout the brain. It moves out of the ventricular system into the brain parenchyma, shown here in gray, and there it can move into neurons. So when the vector comes in contact with the neuron, it is endocytosed. The capsid is then shed, and this good copy, functional copy of CDKL5 is inserted into the nucleus. It can then be transcribed and translated, and we have production of functional CDKL5 protein. I wanna take just a moment to go through the study design for our efficacy studies done in the CDD mouse model. Here we're using the exon deletion, the exon six deletion mouse model. And all of these studies were done in collaboration with Dr. Rodney Simaco at Baylor College of Medicine. This is a busy slide, but there are three things that I want you to pay attention to. The first is that we decided to inject the mice at four to five weeks of age, which is roughly equivalent to about four to 11 years of age in human brain development. And we thought that this was important because we wanted this study to be translationally relevant. We wanted to inject the mice at a time point where it was an equivalent to an age in humans where they would be diagnosed and they would be able to receive our gene therapy. We also chose this age because we know that as mice get older, it becomes more and more difficult to get a very high number of neurons targeted with an AAV9 vector. So if you inject them when they're very first born at postnatal day one, you can get a really nice distribution throughout the brain and you can hit a large number of neurons. We know though that as you increase the size from a very tiny rodent brain up to a larger monkey brain or a human brain, ultimately, what we really struggle with with gene therapy right now is targeting a large percentage of the neurons. So what we wanted to do in this experiment was to say, if we can only target a small number of neurons in the mouse, could that still be sufficient to ameliorate some of the symptoms that the, this mouse model has, ameliorate some of these behaviors. The second thing to pay attention to here is that we chose to use both males and females in this study. We thought this was important because the biology is a little bit different between these two sexes. Because CDKL5 is present on the X chromosome, females have two copies of CDKL5 because they have two X chromosomes. Males, on the other hand, have only one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So when CDKL5 is mutant and not functional, all of the neurons in males have non-functional CDKL5. Whereas in females, 50% of their neurons still have functional CDKL5, whereas the other 50% do not. So we wanted to see how efficacious our gene therapy might be in both males and females. The trick here is that in the mouse model, the females don't develop symptoms until a little bit later. So we waited to test the females until they were 16 to 18 weeks of age, just to be sure that the untreated mice were manifesting a very strong and robust behavioral deficit that we could, so that we could see whether we could fix that with our gene therapy. And the males were tested at 10 to 12 weeks of age. The last thing to pay attention to is that we chose to use two different injection techniques. In our very early proof of concept studies, we used an intraparenchymal injection. So we went right into that brain parenchyma. The, the positive thing about that is that you can achieve really good transduction, meaning that the, the vector can move into a large percentage of neurons, but in a really pretty small space. Um, for our future studies, we chose to use an ICV injection, and that stands for intracerebral ventricular, meaning that we injected the vector into the lateral ventricle so that it could circulate through the cerebral spinal fluid and really distribute across the entire brain. So in these first studies, we used that intraparenchymal injection into the cortex. And you can see in this image here that we have 
a really good number of neurons that were targeted. We have great expression of our human CDKL5 transgene. Um, so this is looking at mRNA. This is an RNA scope technique. So in red, CDKL5 mRNA. And then we can dissect out this region and we can look by Western blot at the amount of CDKL5 protein that's expressed. And what you can see here in the Western blot at the bottom is that in the untreated mice, there is no CDKL5 expression. In our mice treated with AAB9, we have CDKL5 expression that's equal to the wild types or actually even a little bit more. And then the next thing that's important is that we see that the CDKL5 we're expressing from our vector is a functional kinase because we can see that it is phosphorylating its downstream target EB2. And in the untreated mice, you can see here that this is a very faint band for phospho-EB2. In the treated mice, this band looks equivalent to what it looks like in the wild type mice. The next study that we did was to move to an ICV injection, again, as I said, so that we could get better distribution throughout the entire brain. Here, we're looking at an RNA scope signal. So this is mRNA for human CDKL5, and we can see a very nice air, broad area of expression. And then because this magnitude, uh, sorry, the magnification of this image is so low, it's you're only picking up on the highest expressing cells, but I can tell you that when you zoom in, even toward the back of the brain here, we also see that there are some cells that express CDKL5. The next thing we did was to dissect out the frontal cortex and the hippocampus and to quantify the number of vector genomes in these two regions using PCR. Here, we decided to use four different dose levels to see if we had a nice dose response, and these animals were sacrificed two weeks after injection. What you, what you can see in the green bars is that we have over a million vector genome copies at our highest dose, and that um, the number of vector genome copies decreases as we decrease the dose. The next thing we wanted to see was whether or not we had stability over time. So this was two weeks after injection, but we wanted to make sure that we still had the same number of vector genome copies when we looked out here three and a half months later. In this case, we were injecting into female mice and we used only the top dose. So 1E12 vector genome copies. We dissected the brain into a number of different areas, and we can see at the frontal cortex, the hippocampus, the striatum, and the thalamus, we have well over a million vector genome copies. It goes down a little bit as you get to the very back of the brain, the brain stem and the cerebellum, but we still have a good number of vector genome copies, even three and a half months after injection. The next thing we wanted to look at was expression. So again, this is an ICV injection. And here we are injecting into male CDKL5 deficient mice. Um, and we are sacrificing these mice two months after injection. On the top here, you can see an RNA scope analysis using a probe against the mouse CDKL5 in our wild type mice. And this is really to show you what the gold standard is. What does CDKL5 normally look like? in a normal mouse. You can see it's present in basically every neuron. And then when we look at our untreated CDD mice, we see a blank signal, no expression of CDKL5. After treatment with our AAV9 vector, we see really nice expression in um, a, a small percentage of cells. We don't target all the cells, which is what we expected, um, but the cells where we target, we see really nice expression of human CDKL5. Next, we dissected out the frontal cortex and the hippocampus and again did Western blots to look at protein expression. And we see that we express about 20% of wild type levels of CDKL5 in the frontal cortex and about 35% in the hippocampus. So again, a small amount of protein, but certainly an increase over our untreated controls. And the big question is whether or not this small increase in CDKL5 is sufficient to normalize or improve some of the behaviors that we see in these mice. So the first behaviors that we looked at were looking at motor function, and we had two different assays, the parallel rod floor plate, which is designed really to look at motor coordination, involves placing the mouse inside a 
clear plexiglass box where the bottom is um, parallel rods. And the mice walk along these rods and you can measure the number of times that their foot slips in between. So when they miss that foot placement and it slips down, that's counted as one foot slip. And you can see represented on the graph that even the wild type mice have over a hundred foot slips during the course of this test. So it's a difficult task. The white bar represents our untreated CDD mice and they have many more foot slips than the wild type controls. When we treat with our AEV9 vector, we're somewhere in between. So we're not completely normalized back to wild type, but we're absolutely improved over the untreated controls. The second test we looked at was an open field test. This is again a pretty simple test. The mice are placed inside a clear plexiglass box and infrared beams are used to detect the movement and measure the activity of the mice. We measure things like distance traveled and time spent active or moving. When we plot the total distance traveled, you can see that there is a hyperactivity phenotype that we see in the CDD mice where they move a lot more than their wild type controls. When we treat with our AAV9 vector, we are much closer to wild type than we are to the untreated controls, but we're not all the way there. So we see an improvement, but not a complete normalization. The next set of behaviors we wanted to look, let, look at were learning and memory. And here we chose to use a cued fear memory test. In this test, the mice are placed in a novel context and they are trained that when they hear a tone that they will receive a foot shock. The foot shock is not painful for them, but it's not comfortable. And so it is something that they remember. And if their learning and memory is intact, they'll remember that when they hear that tone that they've never heard before, that means they're gonna get a foot shock. We let the mice rest for 24 hours, and then we test them again. This time they're placed in a modified context. They don't recognize that this was the same cage they were in yesterday when they got the shock, but they are played the exact same tone. And mice, when they're afraid, will freeze. And this is behavior that we can quantify. So if the mouse remembers that that tone was associated with a foot shock, they will show this freezing behavior. What we see in the wild type mice is that they spend about 60% of their time freezing. So they remember what happened the day before. In the CDD untreated mice in the white bar, they have a decrease in the percent time freezing, suggesting that they're not completely able to remember the association of the tone with the foot shock. When we treat with our AAV9 vector shown in blue, we see that we have a complete normalization of this behavior to wild type levels. When we look at the brain regions that are important for this behavior, the hippocampus and the amygdala, we can see that we are expressing very nice levels of um, CDKL5 in those regions. So next I'm gonna tell you about some work we've done with CDD patient iPSC derived neurons. This work was all done in collaboration with Dr. Allison Motri in his lab at UCSD. So patient iPSC drive neurons allow us to test our drug product in human disease cells. So they're a very powerful model. And what Allison had done in his lab as he had shown that there is a transient hyperexcitability of iPSC drive neurons uh, from CDD patients. And um, he also showed that there is the same phenotype in cortical organoids. And what's thought is that this may reflect the seizure activity that's seen in patients. So we have two different readouts here. We take skin cells from the patients that are then, um, that are then transferred into iPSCs, into neural progenitor cells, differentiated into neurons, and then we can plate them and add our AAV9 vector and look at for the expression of synaptic markers. In the second set of experiments, we allowed these neurons to develop into cortical organoids, which are kind of like mini brains. And we can plate those on a multi-electrode array and we can do electrophysiological recordings. 
So in this first set of experiments, what we saw was that iPSC-derived neurospheres showed an increase in synaptic markers seven days after treatment with our AAV9 vector. Here we're using cells from two different patients, a female with an R59X mutation and a male with an R59X mutation. The controls are the, either the mother of the patient or the father of the patient. When we transduce these cells with our AAV9 vector, we see that we're able to um, hit about 15 to 20% of neurons. So again, we don't hit every single neuron in this experiment, um, but we are able to hit a, a small percentage. But even with only hitting a small percentage, we can see that we have um, a small amount of CDKL5 that, uh, protein that's, that is restored. But we also see that we have effects on postsynaptic density 95 and synapsin, both important proteins in the synapse. And we can see that um, the CDD levels are quite low. So these are the untreated cells from CDD patients. But then as we add the AAV9, it goes up. And the same with synapsin. But does, does the increase in those synaptic proteins really lead to a functional improvement? To answer that question, we chose to use a multi-electrode array so that we could record the firing of these neurons. And here we're using our cortical organoids. So the iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells are differentiated for six weeks. And then organoids are placed and are plated and matured for an additional five weeks on this multi electro array prior to treatment. What we see in this experiment is that cortical organoids that have been treated with AAV9 um, virus that has a GFP tag added to the CDKL5 so that we can really visualize it, we see that there are about 15% of cells that are transduced. And what we can see here is that the mean firing rate is increased in the CDD untreated neurons, but that we can restore that down to normal levels of the control two weeks after treatment with AAV9. We can also look at the number of bursts per minute, again, increased, showing that there's this hyperexcitability phenotype that we can normalize after treatment with AAV9. So the take home message here is that transduction of a small percentage of neurons leads to functional improvements in cortical organoid hyperexcitability. Another way to look at this data is to look really at the raw data at what's called raster plots. The raster plots on the left display the electrical activity that was recorded from those cortical organoids over time. So the blue tick marks show burst firing events and each row of tick marks represents action potential firing events from a single electrode. So you can almost imagine this as though those small little brain organoids, little mini human brains that we're growing in a dish are having an EEG cap. It's not exactly like that because the electrodes are on the bottom of the plate, but you can imagine it in the same way. So we're, we're measuring their ability to fire on these plots. And I think you can recognize just very quickly by looking at this, that there's a huge difference between the control and the CDD samples. The neurons are firing in bursts and quite synchronized, whereas there, it's a little bit more sporadic in the controls. Two weeks after treatment with our AAV vector, we start to restore this pattern that to look a lot more like control than it did before treatment. And we can quantify that as a synchrony index. So we have a significant increase in the synchrony index in the untreated CDD samples, but then when they're treated with the AAV9, we bring that back down to control levels. So overall, AAV9 delivery of human CDKL5 in CDD models leads to improvements across a number of different functional domains. And I think that this is really powerful. We didn't just look at one thing, we looked at a lot of different things. And, and this is a, a summary of everything we looked at and I didn't have time to tell you about all of it today. 
There are some things that we didn't fix, and that's not surprising given that we're only targeting a certain small percentage of neurons in the brain, and um, we are uh, restoring CDKL5 at um, four to five weeks of age in the mouse and not, not really as soon as they're born. We were able to see improvements in motor function and motor coordination, and I showed you that data. We were able to completely normalize performance in the acute fear conditioning assay. We also improved anxiety-like behavior in an elevated plus maze test that I didn't have time to show you today. Um, we did not see improvements in contextual fear conditioning. So again, we don't correct absolutely everything. And we also did not see any improvements in pain nociception. This was using a hot plate assay. For the CD human neurons, we were able to see increased synaptic markers after seven days after treatment, and we were able to, in the organoids, completely normalize across several electrophysiological measures, firing frequency, number of bursts, and percent synchrony. So in conclusion, though we don't completely restore all the deficits in CDD mouse model, even a small amount of CDKL5 introduced at a translationally relevant time during development appears to be beneficial. And I think that this is really encouraging. Functional improvements in human cortical organoids can also be achieved even when only about 15% of the cells are transduced. From a therapeutic intervention perspective for CDD patients, these data are encouraging since targeting a high percentage of neurons in a larger brain remains very challenging for us and really for the field of CNS gene therapies right now. We've developed a proprietary HeLa producer cell line platform that will enable scale up of the manufacturing process in an efficient way so that sufficient drug product can be made to serve this large patient population. And we want you to know that we're thinking about this, we're thinking ahead, um, and we wanna make sure that we can manufacture this. This is a big part of it. We need to test it to make sure that it's safe and that it works, but we also need to be able to manufacture it in large quantities. And one key translational challenge going forward is that we need to find ways to deliver our vector to increase numbers of neurons across a much larger non-human primate brain. We're currently working very diligently to overcome this challenge, and I, I hope to have some exciting data to share with you in the future. Just want to acknowledge all of the people who contributed to the work that I showed you today. We have a very large team working on this program at Ultragenics. This is only a small number of them who helped to generate the data that I showed in the slides. Um, we are also very thankful to Rodney Samako and his team at Bailey College of Medicine, as well as Allison Motri and his team at UCSD. Thank you very much.